I'm going to be talking today about uh, uh, not only the topic, building the universe with mathematics, but also how I came about to get to this topic and uh, what the idea behind this topic is. And uh, I think I'm going to start uh, by, as Lisa said, I grew up in Mumbai. So I'm going to, I'm going to take you back uh, to the beginning. Uh, this is 1977 in Mumbai where I was a beginning uh, mathematics student uh, in my bachelor's class. And uh, we had a professor by the name of uh, Professor Huzur Bazar, who was a great algebra teacher. He was teaching us abstract algebra about numbers and so on. And he made a comment that uh, he showed us something that really, I would say really changed my life in many ways. So let me, let me share with you uh, what happened that day uh, in 1977 in Mumbai in this classroom uh, at an institution called the Institution of Science. So Professor Huzur Bazar uh, basically told us this one statement by the uh, mathematician Kronecker, who said that God gave us the whole numbers and everything else is the work of mankind, of humans. And what he was what he meant was that if you look at the numbers one, two, three, four, uh, they're kind of God-given. And once you have them, you can create everything else from them. And then he went on to say that actually, that's not true. Actually, I can do better. Uh, we don't need God. I can create the numbers as well, and, I, and so can you. And he proceeded to show us how that can be done. And... Um, this was something that was you know, truly amazing. So I'm going to actually go through that uh, proof with you. And this is where the title of my book, The Big Bang of Numbers, comes from. So let me show you how you can actually build all the numbers from nothing. And so this, is, this was uh, Professor Huzur Bazar's uh, idea. And now, building something out of nothing is uh, it has a Latin uh, term to it, creatio ex nihilo. Uh, it comes up in religion where God is supposed to have created everything out of nothing. It comes up in physics where you know maybe you don't have nothing, but you have a singularity and that's from which the Big Bang emerges, everything emerges. But mathematicians do it best. And I'm gonna show you how that's done. So uh, here is uh, this kind of, it's always, you know, anytime you're doing something out of nothing, is there's going to be some sort of trick involved. So this is what he did. Uh, now, mathematicians start with uh, nothing that is uh, a very specific idea. And what we mean by nothing is what is called the empty set. Now, some of you, most of you might have heard what a set is. You might know what a set is, but a set is simply a collection of objects. For example, the set of all uh people who are uh, looking at this, at this program, for example. Uh, so if you have some set, let's say uh, a set of all numbers that are greater than one, well, that's gonna contain these elements. Suppose you have a set that doesn't contain anything. Uh, for example, the numbers, the set of all numbers that is both greater than one and less than one. You know, there's not going to be anything like that. So that's going to be an empty set. So what he began with is something called the empty set, which is just a set that doesn't contain anything. And then he defined that to be the number zero. So this is actually not so uh, different from how various cultures came up with the number zero. The Hindus in particular, they looked at the void and identified it with a number. And so this is what mathematicians are also doing. Once you do that, now comes the crucial step. Supposing you take a set that contains the empty set. So now this bigger set, uh, notice that it's no longer empty because it actually contains something, contains this empty set. So what you now have is something that's no longer just emptiness and you define this to be the number one. So now we have zero and from nothing, we've actually got this number one. Well, uh, once you have the number one, then you can actually 
do something with both of those. So you've got zero, which is the empty set. You have one, which is a set containing the empty set. Let's now take a larger set that contains both of these. And notice that what happens now is you now have something which has two elements in it. So you now identify this as the number two. And you can keep doing this. So each time you have a set, you can now create its successor. Uh, three is the set containing zero, one, two. Four is the set containing zero, one, two, three, and so on. You can keep building these sets. And notice that something that's very interesting, uh, each set exactly has as many objects as you expect it to. So three has exactly three elements, four has exactly three elements, as four, four elements, and so on. So each set has exactly n elements. So that is how we identify numbers in any case. It's like the uh, faces of a die, for example. Now here's what happens. Once you start on this, uh, you find that the numbers just start following from each other. It's almost like there's a fuse and that's been lit. And, and that is the Big Bang. What you find is that starting with nothing, you can now create one, one creates two, two creates three, and suddenly you have all these numbers following. And so out of not emptiness, we've actually made all the numbers come into being. So this was what uh, Professor Huzur told us. And um, I was actually a physics major and I switched to mathematics soon after. And uh, that was in 77, I finished my bachelor's, I came to the US, uh, I studied at Carnegie Mellon University, did my PhD there, and then came to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where I became a professor and have been since uh, 83. Um, and uh, what happened then was that I started writing. So as Lisa told you, um, I actually have written books. So uh, while being a professor, I thought, okay, I need to do something else besides just mathematics. So in secret, I was playing with writing and I started writing fiction. And many years later, uh, in 2001, actually, uh, I came up with a book which did very well, the, the, the Death of Vishnu. It was set in Mumbai. And uh, several years later, I followed it with The Age of Shiva and The City of Devi. So that's kind of a time-lapse uh, picture of where I was for all those years. Well, um, as a result of being a writer, I was... Um, I started writing for the New York Times, started writing opinion pieces for the New York Times. And uh, perhaps the most successful opinion piece was a piece in which I talked about how mathematics is not just about calculation, but uh, even more than calculation, it's about ideas. Uh, my goal was to try and figure out some way that uh, you know, people, people, when I was a, uh, going to writing colonies and so on, uh, people who are artists and writers would often come and tell me, hey, we used to love mathematics when we were kids, uh, when we were in school. But then uh, once I became a professional dancer or a professional writer, I didn't have any more chance to do mathematics or to even enjoy it. So uh, what do you say to these people? The, the problem is that if you if you are uh, you know if you like painting you can go to a museum uh, if you like music you can go and listen to it but with mathematics unless you're a professional mathematician you can't really pursue that so this was what my piece was about that um, there should be ways to pursue this and that uh, you really want to have a way of enjoying mathematics. And um, this, this article, you know, some people uh, just told me this doesn't make any sense. Most people actually uh, had a good opinion about it. The article kept climbing the New York Times most email list for the day. Uh, and by the end of the day, it was actually number one. Uh, then it started climbing the most emailed article for the week and by Friday or so, it was number four, then it became number three, then it became number two. 
And it was just about to reach number one when um, the Pope started making all these very controversial statements about uh, abortion and homosexuality and so on. And he basically came bounding up from behind me and leapt over and took my number one spot because he was the most talked about now. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't have a grudge against the Pope. Uh, you might think I do, but I've promised to actually send him a book. In fact, I did send him a book. But this book, in some sense, was something that grew out of this article because I wanted to show people how they can enjoy mathematics without actually being a mathematician, without actually being good at calculation. That's the main idea. You don't have to actually know how to do formulas and so on. You can still enjoy the ideas behind mathematics. So that's what this book comes from. And uh, we are gonna go through this book. That's the US cover, that's the uh, UK cover. And uh, let's see what I can tell you about this. Now, the vehicle uh, for, um, for this book, you know, again, this book is basically a way to express mathematics, to make people enjoy mathematics, and to give the story of mathematics in a very different way. Usually when you look at the story of mathematics, you think about it in terms of history. Uh, this person did this, and then later on, this was discovered, and so on. And the problem is that uh, historical discoveries in mathematics are all over the place. They're not necessarily in chronological order. The book that I'm writing that I've written, I wanted to really show how everything in mathematics is one progression, how uh, arithmetic follows from uh, numbers and how each successive thing topic in math follows from what comes before. And so the framework that I thought about was, again, this idea that Dr. Huzur Bazar had started for us, and that was how can you build up everything starting with nothing? So we saw how you can get the whole numbers. How do you build up everything else? And how far can you go? Can you actually keep going? Can mathematics actually be used to design the whole universe, even build it? How far can one go? And what extra things do you need? So that's the spirit in which I want you to understand the topic for today's talk. When I say how to build the universe using only maths, uh, what I'm talking about is how far can you go, logically speaking. So let's see where we start. So day one, you've already seen, starts with numbers. And so day one is going to consist of arithmetic. And uh, one of the things that I did in this book was uh, really make the numbers characters as if they were characters in a novel. And the reason was the following. Mathematics is... Uh, is a game. If you talk to mathematicians, they will tell you it's, you know, you come up with some rules and then you see where those rules take you and you keep playing this game. Well, if you think about the numbers, what games are they going to play in this universe that you just have numbers to start with? Well, the only things that I could think of were things like addition and multiplication and so on. So think of these numbers as uh, playing games. Uh, they add, you know, to each other and they form another number. They multiply each other and they form another number. The interesting thing is that you add two positive numbers, two positive whole numbers, what do you get? You get another whole number. You multiply two positive whole numbers, you also get another whole number. And this is pretty unusual. This just shows you know, how perfect the set of what I call natural numbers is, uh, these positive whole numbers is. You can add and multiply and you keep, uh, you stay in that same set. Unfortunately, when you start trying to subtract a number from another, you know, if you subtract two from three, you get one. But if you subtract three from two, you get stuck because you don't have anything that can really fulfill uh, the point that you reach. So these games are fine as long as you don't try to undo them. When you try to undo addition, then you end up with subtraction, and that can cause these pairs of numbers to get stuck. This is just an invitation for us to form a new set of numbers. So as we know, if we start forming the negative whole numbers, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, we can actually unstick all these pairs that are stuck, which you can see in this universe. Everything is clogged up. You can unclog it by just creating the negative numbers. This is the kind of idea that mathematicians always uh, follow 
we look for problems and then yeah. we actually welcome problems like these numbers getting stuck because that tells us how we can then create something else to unstick things and go along. So you now have the negative numbers. Well, the same thing could be uh, happening when you try to undo multiplication. You divide six by three, you get two. But if you divide two by three, then you get stuck. So this is another problem. Numbers are stuck again. Well, we know how to take care of that. We will create even new, even more numbers. And these are going to be the fractions, uh, what are also called the rational numbers, because they're the ratios of whole numbers. So this way, we have expanded the set of numbers. Well, these rational numbers have a very interesting property. When you expand them out as a decimal, their decimal expansions will always have uh, a piece that keeps repeating, some string, some finite string that will repeat over and over again. And that's one of the defining characteristics of uh, rational numbers. What about uh, numbers that don't repeat? For example, uh, if you look at the square root of two, uh, then that's a number that doesn't repeat. And this, this you can again arrive at by playing another game, like the square root game. So uh, you can start building these, these irrational numbers as well. And of course, the irrational number that we are all familiar with is pi. And uh, that, as we know, has a decimal expansion that doesn't repeat. <clears throat> now, these numbers are all going to be useful in our universe. So my question is, at this point, how are irrational numbers going to be really useful for you in the universe that you're building? Uh, you might say, hey, you know, irrational numbers like the square root of two or pi really exactly tell you what the value of a certain number is. For example, pi we know is the ratio of the uh, circumference to the diameter. And if we know, to, if we want to get it, get it exactly right, then we would need pi. Well, yes and no. Uh, the problem is that you can never write down pi exactly. Uh, you can only write it to a finite number of uh, points, of digits. And so uh, in practical terms, pi is never used in its entirety. Uh, even NASA, for example, uses pi only to about 15 or 16 digits, and that's enough for all the calculations that they do. More than that would be overkill. So where does pi come up in the universe that we are designing? And this is, this is how this kind of uh, looking at the universe, looking at the design of the universe purely through mathematics gives us another insight. Uh, the way I think of pi being useful is that you get this sort of randomness that is inherent in its digits. This isn't uh, pure randomness. It's only some sort of pseudo randomness, but it's enough for most of our purposes. And randomness will be a essential quality in our universe because it'll lead to uh, things like life emerging or uh, you know lots of uh, interactions occurring and causing interesting results. So this is how randomness, you know the idea, the concept of randomness comes in. and we are grateful to irrational numbers for that. Uh, and of course you can also uh, go on and create complex numbers by taking the square roots of negative numbers. But enough about numbers, enough about day one. We still have uh, all these other days to look at. Uh, the days come from Genesis, uh, where God creates the uh, universe in seven days. And I figured, hey, if it worked for God, maybe it should work for mathematicians as well. So that's what we are going to do. Day one we've seen is arithmetic. Uh, what is day two going to be? And uh, I had two choices here. Uh, could be algebra, could be geometry. And I finally figured it had to be geometry. So day two is going to be geometry. And the reason is you have all these numbers that are floating around in this universe. You need to put them in some order. They need some place to stay, to, to be ordered. <clears throat> and the idea of putting numbers in order actually gives rise to a straight line, as we will see. But day two, geometry uh, starts with uh, 
a very famous uh, quote by the author Vasily Kandinsky, who said that everything starts with a point. Uh, if you think about it, what he meant was when you have a paintbrush and a canvas, uh, when it touches the canvas, basically you get a point and that's how every any painting would start. And uh, we are gonna do the same thing. We are gonna actually start with a point. Now you might say, hey, I thought we were creating everything out of nothing. Where does this point come from? Remember I said, we'll see what additional ingredients are needed. So for geometry, you need something called a point and, and a few other things, which I will come to. Uh, our goal eventually is to create uh, the kinds of ingredients, the kinds of building blocks that will enable us to have all of geometry. Just like Kandinsky created all his paintings with a bunch of iconic building blocks, uh, lines and circles and so on. So uh, how does this work? Well, remember we started with a point, we actually have to start with two points. And uh, a long time ago, uh, the Greek mathematician Euclid came up with this list of axioms or uh, descriptions where he really looked at the idea of two-dimensional geometry and really analyzed it. And he found that uh, you could actually describe all of it with a few building blocks called assumptions or axioms. And one of these was that anytime you have two points, you can join it by a straight line. Not only that, but you can extend the straight line uh, all the way on both ends towards infinity. So we are gonna use the idea of Euclid, but we are gonna do it as a way of constructing our universe, constructing our geometry. Since what we are after right now is really to construct empty space. That's what we really want to do. Uh, Notice that if you look at uh, religious accounts, for example, uh, empty space is something that is always taken for granted. Uh, you know, God does Genesis and all these ingredients are just set on this uh, empty stage, which is just going to exist from before. Uh, in Hinduism, Brahma blows out the universe with a single breath. But again, uh, you assume that there's already going to be some place that's going to collect these, that's going to accept these uh, creations. Mathematicians want to actually create this space. So what we do is we say that, okay, let's start with two points and let's start with Euclid's axioms and assume that each time you have two points, you can join them by a line and you can extend this. Now notice when you have a line, you can actually uh, put all the real numbers on this line. Every number can be put on this line, as we'll see. Uh, but uh, once you have one line, then if you get a third point, uh, which is the, the, the point that you see that's going in the other direction with I, then you can draw another line, a vertical line. And you can start stacking these lines up. So once you start stacking all these lines up, what you will find is, if you can copy this line and stack them up, you then get a plane. So what you're seeing is that with points, you can find a line. With lines, you can stack them up and form a plane. And you can keep doing this. If you have parallel planes, you can stack them up like, uh, like they were pages of a book. And that's how you get three-dimensional space. So suddenly, starting with points, we are able to go all the way to 3D and have this block set up. Now, of course, this 3D space is filling everything and it's completely empty. Uh, these points are just locations. They're not actual, they don't have any actual materiality to them. They're just locations. And basically what we are saying is that 3D space can be constructed by a series of ordered uh, locations. Well, why stop with three dimensions? Uh, we could go higher. We could just repeat the same idea and we could say, okay, now that we have these blocks of 3D space, which are you know, essentially covering everything, we could stack these in some parallel direction and that would give you a fourth dimension and it would give you 4D space. You might say, well, that's a little uh, difficult to uh, really imagine. And it is, it's not only difficult, it's impossible because we are stuck in 3D. But notice that the idea that mathematics gives us 
is uh, not difficult to imagine uh, why that should be true. Because we are seeing how it's done in lower dimensions, and you're just using the same abstract idea, you're just repeating it in a higher dimension. So mathematicians, we, we don't have any special powers to actually think of what 4D space looks like, but uh, we can reassure ourselves uh, with this idea that if you just repeat what you did in 3D, you can actually end up with 4D as well. So this is an interesting point now. We are building this universe. We set out to build uh, what empty space would look like. And notice that already you're seeing that, you know, it doesn't have to be just three dimensions. Uh, mathematics, if you're using mathematics, you could have four dimensions. You could repeat this and get five dimensions or even more. And interestingly, some of these ideas uh, are not so far out. Uh, there are respectable papers written on this in physics journals. And uh, uh, there are also uh, uh, theories in terms of quantum physics where you might indeed have higher dimensions. Well, we talked about how you can have four dimensions. Let me show you something else that could also happen. Uh, what could happen is that your space, instead of being flat, could actually be curved. So let's see how that works out. And at this point, uh, this might be getting very abstract. So I'm going to switch to something that some of you probably do as a hobby, and that is crocheting. So uh, in crochet, what you're doing is you're taking material and you're creating a series of knots, which are very similar to points in some sense, and you can create a line that way. So think of it as exactly what we were doing with a line. Just you know, join together a whole bunch of knots and you get a line. Well, you could do it with two dimensions as well. You could uh, get a bunch of lines, stack them with each other, and try to create a plane. If you had uh, an infinite amount of material, you could actually crochet this plane and you could get a nice wide, you know, something that extends all the way. It's hard to do with crochet because you have to always come back and forth. So you wouldn't actually be able to get a whole plane this way. However, if you do it in terms of circles, you can. So imagine you're starting with a uh, small knot of a bunch of knots and then each concentric circle has more knots. And if you do it correctly, and if you have an infinite number amount of material, you can actually create this circle and it'll keep expanding all the way to infinity. <clears throat> well, if you look at crocheting websites, uh, they will tell you that there are some things that can go wrong with this. And uh, one of the websites that I actually used uh, is in Australia, it's called Spin Cushions. And, uh, it has the following picture in it, which shows you what would happen if you were a little stingy with the material. Supposing you weren't putting in enough knots for each circle, for each successive circle. Let's say you were skimping a little. Well, what would happen then was that the material would be forced to uh, sort of form a sphere. It would sort of curl into itself. And if you did that with the right formula, you would actually end up with a perfect sphere. It would keep curling and would become a perfect sphere. So this is very interesting. This shows that when we constructed the plane uh, by stacking lines, an alternative to that would be that if our lines weren't straight but curved, we might end up with a sphere instead. So spherical geometry is actually a different form of geometry, which is perfectly natural and can appear with similar processes to the ones that we did, that we uh, used to get a plane, you might end up with a sphere instead. There's also another type of problem that crocheting websites point out, and that is that if you use too much material, if you're putting in too much material, what will happen is that this material has to go somewhere so what will happen is that you'll see ruffles along the edge of the patch that you're making. And again, if you start doing that with the right formula, you keep putting in more material that has to go somewhere, you will actually end up with something very exotic, very uh, you know, flamboyant. Uh, and this is what is called a hyperbolic plane. And this has all these folds and curls and everything in it. 
the hyperbolic plane was something that mathematicians only kind of really discovered in terms of hyperbolic geometry uh, in the 19, in the 1800s. Uh, so it was a relatively recent discovery. And uh, this has all the assumptions that Euclid put down, except for one. And by violating that, you get these curved geometries, either a sphere or this hyperbolic plane. Uh, interestingly enough, even though mathematicians only came uh, to know about this recently, uh, life forms have used this for, for like a half billion years. Like corals have been around for uh, millions of years and they've been perfectly conversant with these geometries that us humans took so long to really figure out. And the reason that uh, corals and other life forms uh, use this, and you, you'll see this in lettuce leaves, you'll see this in mushrooms, mushroom caps, and all sorts of other things. Uh, you, you, they use this, the coral uh, finds that this kind of geometry is perfect because it maximizes surface area with the minimum volume. So they want to have a large surface area because they're filtering out nutrients. And so that's why they use this extravagant ruffle geometry. Notice also that a sphere has the minimum amount of surface area in terms of volume. So seeds, for example, might be spherical because you, you don't want too much surface area since that is the most vulnerable and you might damage the nutrients inside. So these geometries uh, are alternatives which you will find uh, in different life forms. And what I want to say is that the same thing can be done in 3D. Again, this is something which we can't really imagine, uh, but 3D space could also be curved. Think of it as, uh, I don't know, a mortar or a pastry bag. If any of you cook, you know, a pastry bag, think of uh, that uh, which is actually, as you squeeze it, you're actually building up space. And uh, if you don't put enough of it, then the space that you're building up will be forced to curl inwards on itself and form something spherical. Whereas if you put too much pastry cream in while you're forming this 3D space, then it'll have to go somewhere, the extra material, and that'll start curling into the fourth dimension. So our, our 3D space that we are constructing could be curved as well. And uh, physical evidence shows that uh, essentially, we can be almost sure that our 3D space is flat. It isn't curved, but there's a slight probability that it is slightly curved, and uh, physical experiments can't really determine that. So we aren't 100% sure uh, that our 3D space isn't curved in some way, and we'll come to this point uh, a little later. Okay, so we're up to day three now, and uh, day three is going to be algebra. And um, you know, it took me so long to write this book that I was constantly doing little uh, animations for myself to keep myself going. So let me show you uh, this animation.
Okay, so there's a reason why I chose this. You know, obviously it has that whole idea of uh, origins and uh, creation and so on, this piece. But also the the idea of algebra speaking uh, is is very important. And here's why. Uh, when I came to day three, I had a problem. And that was that, you know, with mathematics, you can certainly design everything, but how do you actually build something? You know, if you want to translate something into bricks and mortar, you need some other agency. And so I realized that uh, the only way to do that would be to have uh, an external contractor. And so when I say build, I mean build in the sense of uh, emperors like uh, like Shah Jahan or, or Akbar or, uh, you know, uh, other people in history who have been famous builders, but haven't actually built things themselves. They've actually hired someone else to do it. So with mathematics too, uh, you really can set up the instructions for what you want built, but then it's going to be someone else who does the actual uh, building, who actually translates things into reality. And that external agency is going to be nature. You know, nature is something that you can think of nature as God, you can think of nature as physics, but nature is the agency, the contractor that's going to actually do the uh, building for us. Uh, when, when, I, when I talk about nature, you have to transfer these instructions to nature. And what algebra does is it allows you to do that. So you've often heard of mathematics being a language. So, and of course, it's a lot more than a language, but it is that as well. So algebra is the way that you can communicate uh, ideas and uh, prescriptions and formulas and shapes to nature who will then interpret your equations and realize them for you. So that's where algebra fits in. So let's go on to day four, and that's gonna be patterns. And this is, this is a vast uh, area and one of the most fun parts that I had uh, in terms of writing this book because with patterns, you come up with things like, uh, you know, fractals and the shapes of clouds and all these other ge geometries that you need to really describe everything, to have things interact the way we want them to in our universe. And I'm not going to get into all of that. I'm just going to give you one example uh, about patterns, and that is uh, this idea of uh, beauty and uh, how mathematicians can talk about beauty. You've probably heard about the golden ratio and the golden ratio, which is about 1.618 uh, is, you know, it's often said that a rectangle with uh, sides, which are about the proportion of the golden ratio, uh, they're supposed to be the most pleasing to the eye. And uh, this is something that uh, is, you know, often people attribute the Mona Lisa's beauty to the fact that her face, her innermost features can be fit into this golden rectangle. Um, and I, that's not, you know, Leonardo da Vinci actually illustrated a book on this ratio. At that time, it was called the divine proportion. So uh, it is possible that he did experiment with it, uh, but there isn't any real agreement on whether it was done on purpose or not. But in any case, uh, this ratio, if you look at material um, on, on the web about plastic surgeons, there are all sorts of papers as to how uh, to make sure that the distance between the eyes and the uh, lips, uh, the ratio of that to the eyes and the nose is about uh, in this 1.618 ratio because that is supposed to be the most beautiful. So that's one idea of beauty. Um, there's another idea of beauty that mathematicians propose, and that is symmetry. And uh, if you compare different figures, the question is, which one is more symmetric? And you equate symmetry with beauty. So uh, for example, if you look at uh, a rectangle, um, a rectangle can be flipped about two axes and will remain the same. A triangle can be flipped an equilateral triangle can be flipped about three axes, while a square can be flipped about one, two, three, four axes. So in that sense, you could say that there's a measurable way of uh, determining that the square is the most symmetric of these three figures. 
And uh, so it's the most beautiful. And if you look at a hexagon or an octagon or one of these higher polygons, then each one might have even more symmetry, so it might be even more beautiful. And so you could ask the question, well, which figure is going to be the most beautiful of all? And if you think of a circle, it's actually symmetric about any line through it. So that should be you know, the most symmetric of them. Uh, so let's go back to the... Uh, the poor Mona, like Mona Lisa, and you will find that she actually fails even the most basic test of symmetry. The poor thing is not even symmetric about the midline. So she actually has zero axes of symmetry. And so the question arises as mathematicians, can we do better? Uh, and we're going to do that. We'll, we're going to do a mathematical makeover of the Mona Lisa and make her more symmetric and hopefully more beautiful. So this will test the idea whether or not we mathematicians know what we are talking about. Does something with more symmetry make that person or picture more beautiful? Let's see. So what we're gonna do is let's take that one half and just get rid of it. And we'll uh, take the other half and just reproduce it. And you might say, hey, that's, that's not very good. Uh, and the reason is it's too thin. So let's stretch her out a little like that. And huh, well, I don't know, is that more beautiful? Probably not. Um, well, I think the problem is that we need to put in even more symmetry. So let's try to do that. What we'll do is we need, we need symmetry along this axis too. Well, this is too elongated. So I'll squash it down. Well, well, okay, so maybe that's not better either. Uh, she looks kind of funny, I agree. And the, perhaps the reason is that she only has two lines of symmetry. Why not try to make her have more lines of symmetry? So let's work some more with her. And what we'll do now is let us take a piece of her um, with cut and paste, and let's reproduce that and join all that together. Okay, that's uh, kind of uh, too funny. It doesn't even look like a face. Um, and the reason for that is we didn't do it right. So let's do it this other way. I'm going to take this piece and I'm going to join four pieces together. Okay. Well, I don't know if people are going to like this version either. Uh, she looks kind of bloated now, like some sort of soccer ball that is just staring at you. What math? I mean, let's let's not let's not get discouraged. Mathematicians will say, "Let's charge on. Let us make her even more symmetric." So what I'm going to do is take one of those pieces, and I will shrink it a little like that, scrunch her up, and then what I'm going to do is paste eight copies of her into an octagon. Well, at least you can twirl her around now. Uh, you might say, is she getting more beautiful? Well, how about if I make even more slices? Well, now you have to say that, you know, she's getting more beautiful, uh, like a flower or, uh, or, or maybe like a tablecloth or something. So we can keep doing this. And notice what happens. If we keep doing this and take tinier and tinier slivers, what will happen is when we join them together, we will get a circle. And notice that this circle is, um, you know, some sort of blended image of her. So it's no longer the Mona Lisa, but it is her imprint. And uh, if you take some other picture, you'll get some different imprint. So uh, this, you would have to say, is actually, does have a uh, claim to beauty. And in fact, these are two different ideas of beauty. Uh, you have the original golden ratio type beauty, and you have the Mona Lisa circle. And it's really up to you which aesthetic you, you like. Now, uh, this, you know, I experimented with this. Uh, you know, in the US, we're, we're all uh, waiting to see what happens with the next election. Uh, and so I tried doing this uh, to both Trump and Biden. So let's see what happened when I did that. And um, you will see that they both got a little ferocious when I uh, 
cut and paste them, maybe Trump a little much more than Biden. And that became worse in this case. But eventually, they were pretty harmless. And so if you're scared of them, do this, and you can actually hang them on your wall, and everything will be fine. Uh, okay, so let's go on to day five. And day five is going to be physics. And uh, <clears throat> something interesting is going to happen in day five. Remember, we talked about uh, the different types of curved geometries that uh, we discovered when we were trying to see how we could actually make our universe, how we could create the empty space for our universe. And uh, we talked about hyperbolic geometry and you know, spherical geometry, how these two things are, have, have a curvature to them. Well, uh, surprisingly, this is exactly the type of idea that Einstein used uh, to really explain the theory of gravitation. So in his general relativity theory, uh, what he did was he basically assumed that space-time was curved and that instead of, uh, that the way that gravity acts is that if you have a heavy object, it, it curves the space-time around it and that's what leads objects to uh, follow these curvature, follow this curvature and be attracted to the heavier body. So it's very interesting that uh, you can actually take these mathematical principles and use them in physics. And this isn't the only example. There's a whole bunch of examples where you can come up with uh, very simple mathematical principles and see how they appear in physics. For example, just the idea that if you have two, two masses and you add them together, m1 plus m2, you get a new object, you combine two particles, you have a new particle which has a mass, which is the sum of the components. You know, that's just the arithmetic that we came up with the numbers. So um, again, at, on this day, uh, I was kind of wondering how I'm going to take care of all of physics in my uh, single book. Uh, and it turns out that there was a mathematician by the name of Hilbert, who uh, in 1900, he postulated a whole bunch of open problems in mathematics. And one of the ones was to say that uh, everything in physics can be, all the computational parts in physics can be derived from certain assumptions, certain axioms, just like mathematicians do. So his idea was start with the right assumptions and you'll be able to derive all of physics. And that's a pretty tall order and people have been working on it and it's not clear that it can be done, but uh, that is the way to think of physics as coming from mathematics. Now, uh, I should point out that physics and math are very different. Uh, math starts with assumptions, physics starts with observations, uh, but they have this uh, way of really uh, needing each other. But the more interesting idea that I want to point out at this point is that this example of Einstein using something that, was, uh, that came up uh, like 50 years earlier or 100 years earlier in terms of geometry, curved geometry, is, is very revealing. Uh, the mathematicians like Gauss and Boyle and so on, who actually came up with these curved geometries, were not thinking of relativity. They were not thinking of gravity. They were not thinking of anything physical. They were just looking at an abstract idea. Uh, and they came up with these examples just from pure abstraction. They weren't thinking of chordals or anything. How then? did it turn out that these purely abstract ideas turned out to be exactly the right ideas that explain our physical universe many years later? This, this kind of phenomenon occurs over and over again. For example, uh, the Greeks came up with the idea of ellipses, of parabolas, and of hyperbolas, of these conic sections. This was you know, hundreds of years ago. Many, many centuries later, Kepler used precisely the ellipse and other conic sections to explain how uh, planets actually go around the sun. Again, something completely abstract, 
turns out to be something that scientists, physics, physicists actually use and explain the universe with. There, there's so many examples of that where purely theoretical mathematical results have translated into actual, uh, actual things that we use to explain our universe. This is why I feel the way to think about this is that mathematics is really the intelligence of the universe, that it is the guiding force that there are these laws, mathematical laws, and uh, we discover them, we, we chance upon them, and then they turn out to be perfect matches for actually explaining the universe. And that is one of the ideas that is in this book. Uh, the other idea is that we use mathematics to explain observations, but I think the, 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 the way that we are thinking of it, or I'm thinking of it in this book is, is very interesting. Mathematics is the central, uh, driver of the universe, and nature tries to uh, implement uh, the instructions it gets from mathematics to actually create the physical universe, physical reality. That sort of explains why these kinds of ideas, abstract ideas, end up so frequently uh, having all these uses. So, so that's physics, and uh, we have two more days to go, so let me uh, hurry a little because we are almost out of time. So day six, is going to be infinity. Uh, and this is interesting. Uh, when I first started this book, uh, I, I said I'm a novelist, so I should write a, a novel. And this novel was going to be called The Godfather of Numbers. And um, it was an attempt to actually show the whole uh, idea of you know, creation of the universe through um, fiction. And uh, Infinity turned out to be the most central character. Um, even though we never actually uh, encounter Infinity, uh, it turns out to really operate at so many levels in mathematics and in reality that it is like a godfather and it's really uh, controlling everything without us actually ever seeing it. And uh, there are many ideas here that uh, I'm not gonna have time to go into, but um, you know, this is this is always an open question: Is our universe finite or is it infinite? And um, understanding infinity is one of the key things to really understanding the universe as well. Uh, remember, in physics, for example, you know everything emerges from the singularity, which has infinite density in a way. So uh, you really need to know what infinity is and what how the role it plays in, in our universe. Okay, so we are finally up to day seven. And if you remember Genesis, uh, day seven is a day of rest. So, um, you know, God takes a rest after six days and mathematicians too deserve to have some rest, I would think. So uh, how does that work out? Well, day seven is what is gonna be called emergence. So this is something also very interesting. Uh, essentially, what happens is that a number of processes that can be put into motion uh, will evolve in the background and start giving you the kinds of things that you're looking for. Now, uh, this emergence refers to the idea that very simple formulas or very simple ideas, very simple equations, uh, can actually lead to great complexity. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one example is uh, the following. Imagine that you take a whole bunch of people who are facing different directions and you ask them to converge and stand at exactly one point. So all these people are facing some random directions and they're all concentrated at one single point. And then you tell them all to move three steps forward. Each one has to move three steps forward or three feet forward. What do you think will form? You know, they'll all move three feet forward. And if there are enough people, and if they are facing all sorts of random directions, when they move three feet forward from that central point, they will form a perfect circle. And you might say, how did that happen? You know, this was just randomness. And then you gave a simple instruction 
and you weren't really plotting to find a circle or anything, and yet you formed a circle. So this is an example of emergence, how something can emerge without there being any uh, intelligence or any uh, pre-thought put into it, pre-meditation put into it, and uh, you still get a pattern that is uh, something that you wouldn't expect. Uh, my favorite example in this kind of emergence is the following. Um, if you've ever seen ants, they're often looking for food. And let's say their nest is at one point and they've found food at another point. They will have a whole bunch of paths that they might actually take to get to the food. Now, as they go along, uh, ants will uh, put down something called pheromones, which uh, are something that they can sense and that attract other ants. So what will happen is that uh, all the ants, as they go along these paths, they'll keep putting down pheromones. If you look at the shorter path, then they're going to be in any time interval, they're going to be more ants going back and forth because it's shorter. So there's going to be more ants there. Uh, and so there'll be more pheromones there. And that will attract even more ants. The longer path, there'll be fewer pheromones. Uh, the wind will come. It might carry some of the, the, the scent away. And since there are fewer ants, eventually that longer path will just die out. And you will find that the ants have optimized their method of getting to the food. Uh, and they have found the shortest path. They have, they have found the optimal path. And you might say, wow, ants can optimize. They have intelligence. And this is called animal intelligence, insect intelligence, but it's not really the type of intelligence that we think about. It's something emergent that they have chanced upon this by a very simple algorithm, just put down pheromones and you optimize with that. Same kinds of ideas uh, lead to, uh, you know, if you look at the book, things like fractals and so on, they're, they're, they're very complex things which patterns which come from very simple rules. Uh, and so people have theorized that these are the kinds of processes that may have led to life as well, in terms of you know jumps in complexity occurring by very simple rules being applied over and over again. Now, mathematics can't explain such mysteries, but it can certainly give you examples or metaphors that point to how uh, these things could happen. And so uh, this idea of the shorter path being the prevalent one is uh, very instructive in terms of that. So uh, I will uh, leave you with uh, the following uh, question. Uh, mathematics is often uh, considered to be you know, an invention, a human invention that we actually come up with mathematics, that we come up with numbers and we use it to explain everything. But Plato thought that mathematics and all mathematical entities were something that existed somewhere and that we only as humans discovered them, that we, you know, the heavens parted and we got a glimpse of these things. So the question is, uh, does mathematics arise by itself? You know, can you imagine uh, nothingness creating uh, the numbers, creating uh, geometry and algebra and so on all by itself? Or is it all a human invention? And uh, this kind of question uh, actually speaks to our very own identity. Uh, are we here for a purpose or is it just as a result of chance? And that kind of gets into almost a religious question. But what I'm trying to say is that mathematics also gives you some insights into such weighty questions. And my last slide is the following. Uh, this is what I got back from the Pope. Uh, I did send him a book. And uh, a few weeks later, or a month later, uh, I was told that the Pope had received my book uh, and that you know his assistant said he was thanking me for it. And there's gonna be a remembrance of uh, the book in his prayers. And when I got this letter, I was very happy because uh, I, I, when, I, when I got the envelope, I was wondering whether it was a friendly letter or if it was from the Pope's lawyer uh, in terms of using him as a character in my book. So fortunately, he is blessing it. So uh, I'll leave you with this. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm open to questions now.